Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Breachside Broadcast, home of the finest foxcasting either side of the breach. Today's episode is a delightful little children's tale that stars an assortment of puppets, big and small. There are those who say that shadowy forces pull the strings in Malifaux, and that many of the city's most feared and reviled personalities are themselves controlled by sinister puppet masters. In this story, we meet a much more literal puppet master, but you can be certain he is no less sinister. I hope you enjoy Hidden Music. Today's episode of the Bleach Art Broadcast is brought to you by Giuseppe's Toy Shop, home of Malifaux's largest selection of dolls and puppets. Giuseppe's recently had a new delivery of marionettes from one Mr. Collodi. Don't be fooled by the sharp wooden claws. We have been assured that these remarkable toys conform to the most rigorous safety standards. A marionette makes a perfect accompaniment to one of Mr. Ryder's ever popular and not at all poisonous dolls. Girls and boys alike will treasure these wonderful gifts until their dying day. The Hidden Music by Jonathan Boynton Cynthia Hale jumped at the loud squeak of a rat as it scurried through the dim pool of light from the lamppost. She clutched a small bag to her chest, edging away from the rodent as it paused to sniff the air. Gulping in lungfuls of air, she fought down her terror, forcing her trembling hands to her side while the creature ran into the foggy night. After the incident in the sewers last year, she'd never been able to look at rats the same way. She still had an all-too-common nightmare of Margaret's disturbing death. Black ichor pouring from her mouth and nose. The awful noise of the showgirl choking. The sickly sweet smell. Cynthia shook herself and pulled her coat closer against the chill that hung in the damp air. She looked around anxiously, staring into the shadows of the carnival gate. In the dark fog, the carnival looked like a different world. She had visited earlier in the day to make sure her contact was here, and the place had been bright and loud. The wagons were painted in wonderful colours, intricate murals and stories that inspired awe and marvel. At night, the characters in these same murals seemed to leer from their homes, lifeless eyes following her as she shifted from foot to foot nervously. The silence was even more unnerving. Compared to the light gaiety of the day, there was nothing to hear aside from her ragged breathing and the occasional vermin that ran past. Clicking from behind made Cynthia spin slamming her back painfully into a lamppost. She pulled a derringer out of her dress pocket, pointing the weapon, long-drilled instinct steadying her hand. A figure loomed out of the dark to join Cynthia in the lamplight, and the showgirl heaved a sigh of relief, leaning against the newcomer. Amethyst, don't do that to me, she complained, stuffing the pistol back into its hiding place. Cynthia scowled at the porcelain mask, stuck in a perpetual smirk that adorned the Carafe's face. She hated that Colette had sent this particular one along with her. She always felt like the thing was laughing at her. It never used to be like this, she insisted to the immobile smirk. I really didn't. Was the best shot in the show I was. Miss Dubois said it herself. Amethyst just stared, then tilted its head the opposite way. Cynthia stuck her tongue out at the construct, then turned back to the carnival. She pulled in a deep breath, her nerves relaxing at the reassuring presence of her companion. Now, where's that supply wagon? she muttered. After a moment, she stood on her toes to try and see above the fog. Bah! Can't see a thing. She glanced back to the city longingly for a moment, then hung her head. If she didn't get moving, she'd miss her deadline. 
Cynthia opened the bag, checking the small fortune of soul stones contained within. Colette and the other girls were counting on her. Time to go, Amethyst, she said, snapping the handbag closed. Hands clasped together in an attempt to still the trembling as she marched into the fog, head high. The clicking of wooden limbs wove into the rhythm in Collodi's head. The puppeteer's fingers moved deftly as it worked, the soft sound of the carving building into the symphony in its head. It paused to admire the face emerging from the wooden block, glancing at the template that sat nearby. As the song wore down, the puppeteer hurriedly returned to the tools, movement slowing to an easier pace as the music returned. A small amount of starlight leaked in through the tiny ornate window at the front of the caravan wagon, providing little illumination. Marionettes surrounded Claudie, perched onto shelves that filled the tight space, colourful outfits splashing colour into the faint light. They watched as the puppet master made them a new sister, one or two of the most adventurous crawling onto the workbench. The puppets were Claudie's children, one of the few sources of the music anymore. Old Malifaux was gone, along with it the creators. Now the music they had given was dying, becoming harder to hear as the centuries passed. One of the girl dolls reached up from the floor, gently tugging at its master's robe, and Claudie reached down with a lower hand to gently pat its fake hair. Over the years, Claudie had collected so many marionettes, their natures wide and varied. Each would take a different role on the stage, where the puppeteer hid in plain sight from the humans it so hated. It had never stopped the shows, and couldn't bear to even though it was hated by the humans. The shows kept the music flowing and brought new materials for its children. The wooden dolls were so similar to the children that inspired them that their masters still marveled at how the naive humans never saw through the deception. The music continued to play as Collodi finished the doll's face, gently turning it over to examine the inside. A lower limb reached over to the template, dipping a wooden finger into the small female's blood. Collodi examined the dark liquid in the starlight, then used it to write on the carved wood. A pinch of soulstone dust scattered over the words bound them to the emerging puppet, the gleam of the dust echoing the bright melody swirling round the wagon. The puppeteer began attaching the face to the body that sat on the bench lower limbs reaching for the small outfits that had been prepared earlier. A sudden noise from outside the wagon made the music come to a screeching, discordant halt. Claudie's hands twitched, and it looked up angrily at the window. After a moment, the puppeteer returned to its work before being interrupted again. The noise built louder, drowning out the symphony with chaotic, atonal crashes. An occasional lamp on the wagons in the carnival helped Cynthia and Amethyst navigate their way through the dark and the fog. The showgirl kept a tight hand on her handbag, nervously inspecting every shadow as she walked. While they travelled, she could feel things watching her from the fog. Every now and then seeing pairs of yellow eyes from short figures that disappeared as she looked close. The silence had gotten worse. Even the rats had hidden away leaving the pair alone in the dim light. Every now and again, Cynthia could hear the clockwork of the corophay as it moved, but she tried to ignore it, along with the rapid beating of her heart. She shivered as a thick patch of fog caressed the pale skin of her face. The cold droplets stung, and she flicked them away. Up ahead there was another light, and she strode towards it. As she looked around, she realized she no longer knew where she was going. This was a part of the ground she hadn't seen this morning. A small circle of wagons surrounded a handful of booths and chairs. They were empty, leaving her only guesses as to the purpose. One seemed to be a miniature stage of all things. This time the light came not from a lantern, but a fire. 
a handful of figures sat around it, and Cynthia hesitated, quietly reaching for her pistol and turning her head to check for Amethyst. The Corifé wasn't there. She could feel her eyes go wide, and she tensed, nervous fingers failing to find the pistol's grip. As she backed away from the fire, she knocked over a metal pail. The sound of clanging metal echoed strangely in the fog. Hello? What's this? A lanky man stood up from the fire, a metal bar in his hand. The light from the flames accentuated the harshness of his features. A sharp, lean face with a shadow of a beard on his jaw. He wore a pair of glasses that glowed a faint orange as he looked at her, and took a drag on a cigar. Looks like we got a mouse that wandered the wrong way, Duggins, another said. The broad man pushed off from the wagon he'd been leaning against, tipping back a hat to reveal a scarred, leering face. What you doing here, love? I... I... Words failed as Cynthia stared at them. The third man pulled himself to his feet, favouring a metal prosthetic leg. He looked her up and down, expression curiously blank. He was bald with an unkempt black beard shot through with grey. Expensive clothes, Duggins. Bet she's got something worth the trouble. Oi, you might be right there, Anders, the thin man agreed, shifting the bar into a two-handed grip. What do you say, lass? We can make this nice and quick if you like. Just show us what's in that there purse. I can't, she finally stammered. Somewhere in the back of her mind, she remembered the pistol and began to reach for it. A massive paw grabbed her wrist. Another wrapped around her neck. Cynthia screamed as the handbag was roughly pulled out of her grasp. That won't do you any good here, the fourth man growled from behind her, shifting his grip to cover her mouth. Don't you worry, none. We ain't gonna hurt you. Just interested in your valuables. Toss the bag here, Rook, and let's have a look. Desperately, Cynthia bit the man's hand, ramming her free elbow back into his stomach. The man howled, letting her go. She spun, ramming a boot into his groin before jumping for the handbag as he dropped it. The big man fell to the ground, groaning as the others stared. Duggins chuckled disturbingly after a moment. Seems this little mouse has teeth. Looks like it's the hard way after all. Anders? Hutchins? Cynthia fled. Kalotti set down the tools, letting the music die with frustration. Clearly the noise from outside was not going to go away on its own. The marionettes stirred, reacting to their master's anger. For some there was an eagerness, for others trepidation. Even in this odd extension of life, the different templates showed through. The puppeteer resentfully moved to the door, plucking a porcelain theatre mask, cane and pair of gloves from where they hung nearby. If the interruption to the music would not go away, Collodi would force the issue. Lower limbs hidden inside the voluminous costume it wore, it pushed the door open, letting a pair of marionettes rush out ahead of it. Other, less aggressive puppets closed the wagon door from the inside as Collodi stalked out, Kane smacking the ground loudly to disguise the sound of its wooden bones rattling against each other. Its eyes hunted for the source of the noise that had interrupted the song settling on a group of adult humans. Hatred stirred dark chords deep within the puppeteer, and it clenched its hidden fists. The marionette pair, joined by others that had snuck out of the wagon's tiny windows after the door shut, shuffled with eagerness in the darkness. There were five of the humans, filling the night with the sounds of their conflict. Glory could see fire and blades, shivering at the bitter tune of the memories that rose. With vicious delight, the puppet master raised its hands, letting its lower limbs slip out from the folds of its robes. Fine strings of thought wove through the night, connecting the marionettes to their master, and they began to tremble as Kalodi took control of their limbs.
She didn't get far before she tripped over something. The bag fell to the ground, cracking open, the soft glow of the stones lighting the night. She could hear the men gasp. The sight of her obligation snapped her wits back into place. The panic bled away, almost easily replaced with a spiky chill that settled into her bones. Cynthia wrapped her hand around the derringer, pulling it smoothly out of its holster, and she rolled over, aiming it at the muggers. They froze, staring at the weapon pointed steadily at them. But back off, she warned, pushing herself back to the handbag and closing it. It took some doing to get to her feet without dropping her aim, but she managed. Just, just stay away from me, all right? I don't want no trouble. Duggins threw his head back and laughed. Oh? And what's going to stop it, eh? You only got two shots, sweetheart. Best make him count, I'd say. He shifted the rod, shoving Anders in the back. Go on, boys. Odds are she don't know what to do with it anyway. Rourke grunted as he stood, towering over the others. He grabbed a chair from nearby and Cynthia felt her terror return as he loomed in front of the fire, shaking with rage. Smoothly, she lined up the pistol and pulled the trigger. The muzzle flashed and the bullet hammered into his knee. He collapsed to the ground, screaming as he grabbed his ruined joint. Down to one, lass, Duggan said, taking a step forward. Out of the dark, Cynthia heard clockwork gears and couldn't help but laugh nervously. It's about time, Amethyst, she shouted, too overjoyed at the arrival of the Corifei to be angry at its earlier absence. The construct leapt out of the fog, landing in a graceful crouch in front of the showgirl. It spread its arms wide, head cocked quizzically at the men. Long, silvery blades swung out wide from hidden compartments in its chest and snapped into position. Before the muggers could react, the construct charged. Every motion was graceful, as if part of a choreographed ballet, the Corifei dancing to a rhythm no one could hear. It darted toward the standing men, fast and elegant even as it slipped a spike heel into Rourke's throat, blood spraying through the air as it moved to reach the standing men. Crimson splattered over Amethyst's purple outfit, and Cynthia felt a stab of irrational panic at the sight. Colette was going to kill her if the Amethyst ruined that dress. With a nervous giggle, she lowered her pistol. Hutchins managed to get a heavy knife in the way of the Corifei's first blade as it turned to him. He blocked the next attack with his arm, grunting as the construct's blade bit into the bone. Savagely, he snapped his head forward, and Cynthia could hear the mask crack despite the noise the brawl was making. The shattered porcelain fell to the ground with a clatter. Without hesitation, Amethyst pushed a foot onto the man's prosthetic, launching itself into the air at Anders. The puppeteer hesitated as a new form danced into the firelight. Ornate dress swirling, blades slashing, the unfamiliar creature moved gracefully through the fight. It was a construct, resembling an adult female much like his marionettes resembled the smaller ones. Blood flew into the air, in an accompaniment to the screams building into... music. Kalodi lowered its limbs staring in wonder at the machine that filled its mind with the most beautiful symphony it had felt since the long-gone times. Amethyst made quick work of Anders, weaving around the man's attempts at defense to neatly place a blade through his temple. His brass knuckles fell to the earth moments before he silently joined them. The Corifei spun, turning back to the man who'd smashed its porcelain mask. Oh, screw it, Duggan said, spitting his cigar onto the ground and tossing his metal rod to Hutchins as the Corifei swept towards the broader man. Keep the damn clockpiece occupied a sec. He pulled a pistol from his waist, pointing it at Cynthia. She screamed when he pulled the trigger, 
the fog turning bright as day as thunder roared. Amethyst twisted on its feet, tossing itself toward the showgirl. When the bullet struck, the construct stumbled, falling to the ground like a cut marionette. Cynthia felt a shard of hot metal scratch her cheek. The showgirl angrily raised her pistol and fired in one fluid motion, a life's worth of training against show targets culminating into one fatal moment. Duggan's head snapped back, and the man fell limp as blood leaked from the bullet wound. As the body hit the ground, Hutchins took the opportunity to flee into the night. Cynthia walked slowly over to the carafe, kneeling next to it and lifting the head. You stupid, wonderful thing, she murmured. If you'd just been here in the first place, well, you wouldn't need to be fixed. But thank you, my dear protector. In rage, Kaladi sent its puppets after the fleeing man, trusting that in the darkness they would be able to find him at least somewhat discreetly. As the marionettes left, the puppeteer watched the female kneel next to the fallen dancer. Kaladi watched, wondered, and then made a decision. Taking a moment to make sure its disguise was in place, it stepped forward. As the female looked up, it searched its memories for lines appropriate to the situation. Can I help, milady? it asked, the words slow and hesitant. Words felt unnatural outside of the context of a stage, as they always did. Cynthia looked up from the lifeless car of fate grabbing for a bladed arm as the stranger stepped forward into the light. She stared at the face beneath the tricorn hat, a tragic theatre mask covering it. The eyes were hidden in the shadows. No, she said, I'm fine. It is a lady's prerogative to lie, the man said after a moment, her forehead furrowed in confusion. Had his accent changed? His voice was oddly flat and slow, too as if he was thinking hard over everything he said. But it would be dishonorable to leave without assisting. What do you require? The accent had changed. In between phrases, his voice shifted slightly. Those archaic sayings as well, the fancy speech. She stood, hiding her trembling hand behind her back as she went to retrieve the bag of soul stones. Are you one of the carnival actors? Another accent slid smoothly into place. All the world's a stage, and all men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. An odd way to say yes, Cynthia replied with a nervous laugh. She glanced around, looking for Duggan's lost pistol. The man didn't reply, resting his hands lightly on a cane. His odd manner reminded her of a madman she had met once. He also had quoted the old masters eloquently, almost at random. This actor seemed like one unable to break from his career, only able to think in terms of plays. There, the metal of the pistol gleamed in the light. She threw aside her calm demeanor, leaping for the gun and rolling to align it with the actor. He didn't move, but tilted his head forward slightly. I mean no harm, fair and gentle woman. Truly, I wish to aid. Ah, that's a laugh, she said. You have somewhere you ought to be, yes? And your dancer, it is broken. Wherefore do you go? Cynthia glanced at the sky, hunting for the moon, then cursed. She was running out of time. It would not be long before she missed her appointment. The showgirl looked at the actor, searching for his eyes. I do. If you want to help, could you hide my... dancer for an hour? I'll pay you fifty scrip in return. 
A deal most agreeable, he pointed at a nearby wagon. In an hour's time, there I should be. Thank you, she said. Taking a deep breath, she sprinted into the fog, pistol held ready. It took only a few minutes to get the dancer into Collardi's wagon. The size of the machine meant the puppeteer could not get it to the workbench. But that did not matter. Marionettes crowded around, watching their master at work. The construct was fascinating, and Collardi wasted no time in examining every aspect of its manufacture. Never before had the music come from another source. The symphonies had been with it since the beginning before the children had been lost to the long, silent years. Always the song had come from its work, from building and entertaining, although the latter had faded over time. Yet here was this dancer, a machine made by masters unknown, and the new song had been... wonderful. As Collotti worked, it could feel glimpses of the enthralling melody that the dancer had made. The technology was strange, unfamiliar, but the puppeteer was confident it could redesign the Corophy. The maker had only been human, after all, lacking in the centuries of experience that Collodi had. Gears and clockwork were held together by iron bones, similar to the wooden limbs of the marionettes. The heart of the machine, however, was missing. The bullet hole passed through the central mechanisms, much to the puppet master's frustration. Before long, the marionettes it had sent after the man returned. Collotti took a moment to look over the stained costumes with some level of annoyance. Cleaning the blood would be problematic, especially off the wooden faces of the puppets. They would have to be held out of the show for some time. The puppeteer took a moment to pat each of the puppets on the head, then returned to its work. A knock at the door made Collotti look up in surprise. The faint glimpses of song faded away and the knock came again. The puppeteer stood, pulling on its disguise, and chewed the marionettes onto the shelves. It opened the door, looking down at the female who stood there. The hour has arrived already, Collotti asked in surprise. Yes, where's Amethyst? The female was agitated, nervously bouncing on her feet. The dancer, remember? Beyond her, Collotti could see a male with a cart. The puppeteer waved her inside, watching as she fussed over the dancer. Could you help me, please? Collotti carefully moved past her, gently lifting up the dancer with care. It was an effort to fake that the construct was too heavy to move on its own. The male stepped forward, and the three of them placed the dancer in the cart. Accepting the proffered paper from the female with a bow, Collotti did not wait for them to leave. Ideas brimming in its mind, the puppeteer stepped back to the wagon. The puppeteer slammed its fists on the table in frustration as the music sputtered and died. Months of work, wasted. Collotti stood, nearby marionettes trembling and shifting uneasily in the presence of their master's wrath. On the table behind, the lifeless dancer lay, the template child sitting discarded nearby. Collotti turned, staring at it, willing the construct to life, but to no avail. The song sat just out of reach, taunting with its nearness. What had gone wrong? This was the third attempt, and the puppet master could not understand. The process was flawless. The modifications to the design perfect, but still the music did not return. Collotti picked up the porcelain mask, turning it over and staring at it deep in thought. The song was more elusive than ever, and had become rarer even when working. This had to work to revive the song. 
The puppeteer had no idea what would happen if the song did not return. It had to. And the dancer, that was where hope lay. Collotti stopped as a thought occurred to it. Perhaps, perhaps the template was wrong. Yes. Excitement grew as the song began to return. Yes, that could be it. And as the puppeteer thought, it realized that it already knew the perfect template. Great job tonight, Cynthia, Judith said as the showgirls changed. The star was closing for the night, the guests already gone. Colette had already given her own review of the evening's performance, giving praise and criticism in equal amounts to the girls. Cynthia smiled as she let her hair down, running her hands through it. Thanks, Judith. You did great, too. Cynthia paused as she walked out the door, looking curiously at a small box that sat next to the mirrors. It was cheerfully decorated, brightly coloured with ornate drawings on it. Strangest of all, it had her name written on a tag in ornate script. What's this? Looks like someone has an admirer, Judith teased, pulling out her earrings and setting them down. It was only a matter of time before you started getting them. Any hint of who it's from? Cynthia turned the tag over, looking for a name. Nothing on the tag. Maybe there's one inside. She moved back to the dresser, setting down the box. It only took a moment to undo the ribbon that held the box together, gently lifting the lid. A small puppet, a girl, sat in the container, a folded note tucked into the hands. A puppet? Well, that's the first for the star, I have to say. Does it at least look like you? Not a bit, the showgirl replied with a laugh taking out the notes and reading it. Oh, it's from the actor at the carnival, the one who helped me with Amethyst. Seems he writes like he talks, even signed it your knight in shining armor. Huh. Judith joined her, picking up the marionette carefully. Well, hopefully you'll attract someone a little more normal next time. Although the doll is pretty adorable. She moved the mouth open and closed. Still, it's the thought that counts, I suppose. Maybe, Cynthia laughed. You want it? I don't really have room for something like this. You can take it if you'd like. Nah, you should keep it honestly. First of many trophies to come, I'm sure. It'll make a good centerpiece for your collection, Judith said with a wink, handing over the puppet. She hugged Cynthia around the shoulders. I'm off for the night. See you tomorrow, dear. Cynthia sat down in a chair in the empty changing room, staring at the strange gift. She turned it over, admiring the craftsmanship of it. The dress looked much like the one she'd worn during her trip to the carnival, although patterned with more festive colours on it. She smiled and stroked a lazy finger over the rosy cheeks. I think Judith's right. You come home with me, little one, and we'll find a place for you. In the meanwhile... It's time we got going home before it gets too dark. She set the puppet down in the box, moving to retrieve her coat from a hook on the wall. Collotti patted the marionette on the head as it paused from its work. The new template had come back perfectly intact for its purposes. The music soared as it finished writing on the newly carved mask, turning it over to admire the face. The adult female proportions were strange to work with, but it had managed. Indeed, the music had changed into something it had never heard before as it worked, a soft, gentle ballad. Its wooden fingers traced a wistful smile, so similar to the female that had travelled with the dancer. Carefully, the puppeteer settled the mask in place, then stepped back. The music rose and soared, before abruptly stopping, 
waiting with anticipation. A beat. Two. And then the dancer stirred. That's it for another episode of the Breachside Broadcast. Join us next week for more Tales of Malifaux.